Today I want to talk about sediments in streams. We've been talking about rivers and streams, and we notice that rivers and streams, well, they're flowing, but as they flow, they transport objects, rocks, boulders, sand particles, silt particles, mud, all that stuff downstream. Comes from the upper reaches, from the um, headwaters, as we learned about earlier, and they transport them downstream. So today we want to learn about just that. So let's get at it. Well, it turns out that there's kind of an interesting uh, uh, table that you need to definitely copy down in your notes. Okay, so here's the, uh, the table. Particle size, classification of sediments and sedimentary rocks. And so uh, basically when scientists look at rocks, they want a classification system is based on their size. All right, here's the sediment and then the particle size. So the largest is called gravel, but gravel actually is subdivided into several other categories, boulders, cobbles, and pebbles. And you can see uh, boulders are bigger than 256 millimeters. Uh, between two and 256 is a cobble, a pebble is two to 64. So we see it getting smaller and smaller. Sand is its own category, it's just between two millimeters and uh, 0.0262, just to kind of give you an idea how big a centimeter or millimeter is. If you were to take your finger, right, and then you have your fingernail right here, this is your fingernail, it looks like a fingernail. Your fingernail is about uh, 10 millimeters in uh, width, the average person. So a sand particle would be, you know, two tenths of that. Okay, and so a pebble would be something, uh, so if your fingernail, uh, if you had a rock the size of your fingernail, it would be called a pebble, if that makes sense. And uh, they get smaller and smaller and get very tiny. And sand particles can be very tiny, 0 0.062 millimeters. Silt is smaller and clay is very, very small. You need a microscope type thing to be able to measure uh, the size of this. And we can also say that these are coarse where these are fine. Now why is that important? Well, it turns out that the larger the particle, okay, a boulder or whatever, the uh, less it travels down a stream because it's too big to travel far down the stream. So um, something else to note is the composition of a sediment is, um, affects what's going to be transported. So what, by the way, the word composition, I want to make sure you understand what that is. Uh, the composition is what the sediment is made of. What I mean by that is what types of rocks and minerals is this sediment made out of, all right? Uh, so gravel are usually pieces of rock. Now what do I mean by rock? Don't forget, a rock really is a mixture of um, different minerals. So rocks are not one particular thing, like quartz is a mineral that is found in many rocks, but uh, not all rocks are minerals. Okay. Uh, a rock, therefore, is a mix of different minerals, which I just, I just said. I just forgot to read that. Sand and silt, however, is primarily mainly made of quartz. This is because it is very hard. So as, as a river flows, it breaks down the sediments, which we're going to see here. And as it breaks down the sediments, it makes them smaller and smaller. And some of the hardest to break down, quartz is being a very, very hard substance. It's one of the hardest things to break down. So mostly sand is made of the stuff that's the hardest to break down, which is quartz. All right, because it's difficult to be broken down. Man, Mr. Bergman, you're saying exactly on the type. All right. Transportation of sediment by streams. Now there are several types of things that can be transported. The first is the substances that are dissolved, or the dissolved particles. And so um, you probably understand the concept. If I take some salt and I drop it into water, um, then it sort of disappears. But it isn't really disappeared. It's carried along invisibly. Okay. This is the process of dissolution. It's the process by which a solid or a liquid forms a homogeneous mixture. You don't necessarily know what homogeneous. How about we just say forms a mixture with, um, and let's just say water here instead of a solvent, because in this case we're talking about rivers, so it's going to only be water. Okay. In fact, why don't we do a real quick video clip where I discuss and show you how things dissolve, because in a river things can dissolve. So in a river, some things can be dissolved. Now dissolved, um, you know, I've got some salt. Salt dissolves in water. So if I take and I pour some salt into the water, and then I stir it. Now I'm stirring it with a stirring rod. But when you uh, are in a river, of course, the turbulent flow the, the, of the river will cause the salt to dissolve. And so this water right here, it looks kind of cloudy. It'll clear up. 
this water has salt dissolved in it. Well, rivers can have minerals dissolved in it, not just salt. Um, that would be one thing it could dissolve. Lots of different minerals um, can have things dissolved. It's invisible to the eye, but it's still there. If I were to take and drink this, I would taste salt water. So that is what we're talking about, dissolution in a river, dissolving in a river. Dissolution is a big fancy word. Now, here's a very important picture to kind of uh, sketch in your notes. The transportation of sediment by streams. The one we just talked about is it's called the dissolved load right here to kind of, kind of get a preview where we're headed. And the dissolved load, notice it's up here and they have a little circle here. These are invisible to the naked eye. You can't see them, but they're there. So if there's particles that are dissolved, these are the minerals that are dissolved. I don't know if you ever drank some water that wasn't uh, that had sort of a high mineral content. It might have had a funny taste to it. It's because of the dissolved minerals. It might look perfectly clear, but the minerals are there. And then we have this next layer of things get transferred on. Those are called the suspended load. This is the stuff that's in the liquid and not along the bottom of the um, of the river. The river is flowing, let's say, in this direction. And so these are. Um, being suspended, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And lastly, it's the bed load, the stuff that basically sits on the bottom and then kind of jumps and moves, as you can see down in the picture. All right, let's talk about each of these. Let's talk about the suspended load. The suspended load is the material that travels down a stream suspended in the water. All right, all right. These particles are generally of the fine sand, silt, and clay size, so the smaller particles tend to be suspended, although larger particles may be carried as well, depending on the intensity of the flow. So if you have a very fast flow, some of the bigger ones can be suspended. All right? This is related to a concept called turbulence. That is the irregular motion of the water. Actually, it isn't always just water. Turbulence is a little more broader than that, but that's the context we're talking about it. This is what keeps the suspended load suspended. All right? I think to really understand turbulence, I found an old cheesy video, and I think we should watch the old cheesy video video about the turbulence. We're going to learn about from old science guy with very strange hair. He's funny looking, okay. Though turbulence is not particularly easy to define, it's not hard to find examples. In these, we can find certain common characteristics. One of the most apparent is disorder, as can be seen in this channel flow. The disorder is of such a fundamental nature that the flow never is reproducible in detail, no matter how carefully one attempts to reproduce all the boundary conditions. Although the details are not reproducible, averages over suitably large intervals of space or time may be very well defined and stable. Disorder, then, is a necessary factor in any definition of turbulence. It is not, however, sufficient. Here is a pretty disordered fluid motion, but it would be unwise to include it in turbulence. A wave field like this does very little mixing, and mixing is an essential feature of turbulent motion. The mixing action of turbulence can lead to complete blending if the volume is confined, or to the dilution, which is the only thing that makes pollution like this, or this, barely tolerable. Another characteristic of turbulence is the presence of vorticity. In a turbulent field, the vorticity is distributed continuously, but irregularly, and in all three dimensions. So turbulent flow has more than one distinguishing characteristic, or symptom. Perhaps we can borrow the word syndrome from pathology and say that we have a defining syndrome or set of symptoms for turbulence. These are disorder, irreproducible in detail, efficient mixing, and vorticity, irregularly distributed in three dimensions. This definition effectively isolates turbulence from various kinds of wave motion. 
It also eliminates all two-dimensional flows. Something roughly like turbulent motion can exist in two dimensions. Weather systems on a large scale represent nearly two-dimensional flows. However, the characteristics of such flows are in many ways so different that it is perhaps unwise to include them in turbulence. <laughs> that was trippy. What an interesting character that must have been. Okay, probably your grandpa's grandpa, right? All right.